God bless you. you. May be seated. We're continuing. Jesus, from the book of Matthew, or the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus comes down from the Sermon on the Mount, and the people are amazed by the authority of his preaching. They like it, and crowds follow him down off that mountain. And as, he fall, as they follow him down off that mountain, it gets even better for the crowd. He starts healing. And he's healing various people, even people on the margins. And you can see an energy kind of building. But what's so unique about Scripture and so very different than the American Christian church is we love the crowd. In fact, most churches are chasing the crowd. And when we, what we see in Jesus is he's almost running away from it. And we're reminded that we, we serve a Lord that's less about the wide and more about the deep. And although he has a love and a compassion for the crowd, so much of his life, so much of his ministry, so much of, of his work was poured into his disciples. And in those personal encounters he had with individuals. <clears throat> and today, we're going we're gonna to see that challenge. A challenge that I think all of us, you know, there's a sense that we, we sense this call to repent of our sins, place our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's, that's this call that's on our life, to follow Jesus, to know him as Lord. But there remains a persistent call in the life of a believer to go deeper. To not remain in the wide and in the easy but to be willing to follow Jesus wherever he's going to go. And what's going to happen in this text is Jesus is going to make an announcement. We're leaving the crowd. They're going to soon step into a boat, go across the Sea of Galilee to get away from the masses. And what's going to happen is a lot of people are going to have to make a choice. Do I hang back with the crowd or do I get in the boat and go where Jesus is going? There's going to be two men, two individuals in this moment. They're going to wrestle with that decision. And Jesus' response to them is, an, oh, it's going to be okay. It's going to be challenge. And I want you to listen to the challenge that Jesus gives to those who are contemplating, do I want the wide or do I want the deep? And so let's take a look. Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 to 22. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then, the, then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Let's pray. Father, we, we hear these challenging words. We, we hear your son speaking to these men, and we don't know the outcome. Lord, we don't know if they said, okay, Jesus. If it means laying my head down on the dry ground at night, that I'll be where you are. If, Lord, if it means putting you first over everything else in my life, I'll be there. We don't know what their answer is, Lord, from this text. But today the question isn't for them, it's for us. And Lord, if there's any here today who sense that although they may love you, may they may know you, they may even be attracted and drawn to the things of you in many ways, they sense that you're calling them deeper. Lord, I pray that they'd set aside anything that's standing in the way of that and follow their Jesus with all their heart. In the precious name of that Savior we pray. Amen. Let's take a look. Let's go right to the text. Let's go right to the passage. In verse 18, it says, When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Now, what's happening here is, again, we see this tension in Jesus with the crowds. Instead of Jesus going, Boy, oh boy, look at everybody here. We actually get this sense, and we can even read as we read throughout the Gospels. That Jesus senses that, in a, that although he has compassion, he teaches, he, he even weeps over the crowds. He's constantly pulling away from them 
because he has a mission and he has work to do that's deeper than what the crowd can experience. And particularly with that core of his disciples. And what we see in this moment is, 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 is this transition point. The people who want to call themselves disciples have to make a decision. Up to this point, they've enjoyed the preaching and teaching. Up to this point, oh, how exciting it would have been to see all the healings and maybe even be healed myself. We also see other moments with the crowd. They got their bellies filled. But now we're going to have to leave the shore, hop into a boat, and be where Jesus is. And there's two individuals who step forward in that group who have the label disciple in a sense over them, but are deciding whether they want that or not. And when they come to Jesus, we see an interesting back and forth between Jesus and these individuals. And as we do, we see, and I think it's very intentional that we don't know the outcome because it becomes more of a question posed to us than to them. I think when we think about our walk in God, there are moments when Jesus says, I'm moving forward. I'm going deeper. I'm moving away from what's shallow and easy. And will you follow me? You have a choice in this moment. You can stay with the crowd. Where we love, serve, and give up to what we want to do and what's convenient and even what's easy. Or you can take up your cross and follow me. And I think as we think about the analogy between the crowd and being a disciple, let's take a look at the first man who steps forward to Jesus and even says, I want to be where you are. Let's take a look at this first man. Look at verse 19. But a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replies, Foxes have holes or have dens, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, in modern American church thinking, somebody shows up to a religious leader and says, Hey, pastor, I'm here. Let's go. I'm, whatever we're doing, I'm, I'm going. And the response usually is like, Praise the Lord! Fantastic! Can't wait! This is awesome! But Jesus almost does the opposite, doesn't he? He gives a warning. He kind of doesn't say it's going to be great. He says it's going to be hard. And as well, this becomes doubly almost puzzling because in the book of Matthew, we find out some information about this man that's unique. And what is it? He's a teacher of the law. He's already a couple rungs up in the religious hierarchy. He's a big catch, a big fish. And you'd think Jesus' response would be, make room at the front of the boat for this guy. Now this, is the, this isn't some fisherman I found at his nets and told him to follow me. This isn't some tax collector in his booth, some lowly guy I said follow me. This is a guy that came to me and said, and he's a big fish. And Jesus almost throws cold water on him. 
in a sense, in Pastor Matt Lingo, he's saying you're, you're, you're digging down the wrong hole and climbing up the wrong tree if you think this is going to be easy. If you think this is going to make your life more comfortable. If you think this is going to move you up the social and religious ladder, you're probably looking in the wrong place. You see, the reason the scripture gives us the detail about this man's background is very purposeful. And for us, it's hard to imagine this, but think in, tar- and think in terms of this man coming to Jesus as an upgrade. You see, in Jesus' day, religious leaders, and not dissimilar to our day, often are jockeying with each other for attention, prestige, and place. And each disciple, so to speak, is looking for the highest teacher. In the book of Acts, Paul is speaking to the people of Jerusalem as they're all wound up against him. And it's even in that moment when he speaks of his credibility before the Jewish people, he mentions his teacher, Gamaliel. You see, in Jesus' day, When you wanted to move up the religious hierarchy, you quoted who your teachers were. And imagine this young man going, well, my teacher was Jesus of Nazareth. And it appears clear by Jesus' answer that this man was not coming to Jesus to put it all on the line. Not to die to self, but to build self. Not to risk it all, but to gain it all. Not to take the road downward into humility and service, but to take the road upward toward being served in status. And the primary difference between the crowd and the disciple is that the crowd comes to the things of God and Jesus for self. The disciple comes to the things of Jesus for sacrifice and service. Let me give you an example. Serving the Lord. There's a difference between how someone from the crowd will serve the Lord versus how a disciple will serve the Lord. You see, many people will serve the Lord because at times it feels good. It's fun. It's what I like to do. It makes me feel certain things and I enjoy it. And so many will be drowned to the things of God, drowned to doing service, drowned to to even things we call ministry, because that's my thing, and I enjoy it, I really like it, and there's nothing wrong with liking it. But there's everything wrong with that being the reason. Because that's how the crowds, there's why do crowds come? Because they like what they see, they like what they feel, they get their bellies felt, it's about them. And when this young, this, this, I'm sorry, I don't know if he's young or not, but when this teacher of the law comes to Jesus, Jesus is saying, we're sleeping on the ground. We're not building our careers here. We're going where I'm leading, not where your upward mobility is trying to lead you. This is about where I'm taking you, not about your goals and where you want to go. And so one who serves from the crowd serves on the basis of self. And the second self isn't satisfied, they're done. It's not the way I want. I don't like how it's being done. I don't like what, you know, I don't, I don't want it this way. But the disciple serves at the command of Jesus. when it's hard, when it's difficult, when it's thankless, when it hurts. I remember there was a moment in my life, I've told you this story before, where I was being mentored by the visitation pastor at the church I was interning at. His name was Pastor Clarence Thornton. I even talked about him yesterday with Bethany. And I was, I was, we were walking into a nursing and was teaching me how to do visitation ministry. And Pastor Thornton had an amazing 
sensitivity to the spirit. And as we're walking into the nursing home, there's this, there's this couch we were walking past and he grabs me by the shoulders and he pushes me down onto the couch and we're sitting there. And Pastor Clarence's motions were always on his sleeve and tears start running down his face. And he says to me, Matt, if you're called to this, if you're called to being a pastor, do it. But if you're not, go and do something else. Because there will be days they will hate you. They will lie about you. They will say all kinds of awful things, and it will be very hard. But if you're called, then you can do it. And that's the heart of a disciple, not a pastor. Okay, take the word pastor out of all that. Take, take the title that's placed over my life out of that. That's the call for every disciple wherever God places them. Do you see the difference? This man came to Jesus and he said, we're not, following me isn't going to be about you. It's going to be about me and where I'm leading. And it may not be fun. It may not be easy. It may not be safe. It may not be comfortable. In fact, where is Jesus leading them? By the way, what, take a look at your Bibles. What's the, next, what's the next thing that's happening when they get into the boat? Yeah, he's taking them into a storm. The disciple follows him into the storm. The one in the crowd runs away. In fact, there's even a moment in John chapter 6 where they stop liking his preaching. This is too hard for us, they say. And many who called him themselves disciples turn away and leave. And Jesus turns to those closest to him and asks them, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, Lord, where will we go? Who else has the very words of life? That's a disciple. And so as we sense the call of Jesus, what often stands in the way is self. And the kingdom is not about building self, but dying to self. And I think if for some of you today, I think there's a certain call being put on your heart towards something deeper and something greater. And one of the challenges that Jesus gives is, is that is it going to be sacrifice and service? Or is it going to be self? Is it going to be gaining my life? Or is it going to be losing it? That's the first man. Now let's look at the second man. Now what's interesting about the second man is another disciple. So these were people at this time that would have been considered disciples. Verse 21. Said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. I want you to pause over that for a moment. What's wrong with that? Now listen to Jesus' reply. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now I want to pause for a moment. And I want to challenge you to have the maturity to look at Scripture, not in a two-dimensional way. Jesus said we're not supposed to bury the dead. You know that's not what that means. God's allowed to be jealous, but we're not. It's like, come on. I call those are really tough questions. A relationship with God is, 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 is exclusive, and God has a right over his creation to say, you must love me first. Man does not have a right to sinfully demand to be first in other people's eyes. That's the difference, right? So we need to look at things in, in, in not a two-dimensional kind of a shallow way. But there's something deeper here Jesus is saying, isn't he? When Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead, what he's saying there is that the spiritually dead are consumed with the things here. That's their priority. But the spiritually alive, their priority is to follow me. Now let me give you a little context. I think it'll help. 
Jewish religious life, perfect, perfect, especially for those who wanted to live a very devoted devotional life to God, was very rigorous. They not only had the law of Torah, that given in the first five books of the Bible, specifically the law of Moses, which was very rigorous, but on top of that were all the teachings of the rabbis that put buffers around those laws to make sure you didn't even get close to violating them. So you not only had the law, but then you had all the teaching of the rabbis that went with it. But on top of that, you had a, you had a, a worship and devotional life that included recitations and times of prayer. And for a devout Jew, for a devout Jew these things were not optional. These things were compulsory. These things had to be done. And when it was the time to pray, you prayed. And when it was the day to do your recitations, you did them. When it came to kosher kitchen and obeying the ceremonial law, you did them. Except there was an exception. And the golden of all golden exceptions, the highest of all high, was when someone in your family was dying or was dead. In fact, there were rabbis in Jesus' day that said that, that not only was the daily devotional worship and prayers able to be set aside during such times, but also even up to the law of Moses could be set aside when you were, doing, when you were in the midst of someone dying or had died in order to candle those things. And so now let's think about what's happening here. Jesus is about ready to cross the boat. We don't know the details. Is the, is the father dying? Is he dead? We don't know. But what we do know is Jesus is saying, we're pulling out. Disciples, come along. Crowd? And this man, I think, if I, if I put it in modern terms, is giving his... Not, not asking for leave, but giving his resignation letter with what he believes is a golden excuse. In fact, in Jewish circles, there may have been no more golden excuse than this one. And so he goes to Jesus and says, I would follow you. I'd be your disciple. I'd go where you go, but golden excuse. And Jesus is not saying that we don't take care of our families, we don't honor our father and mothers, that, that even as the, as, as, the, as the epistles tell us that it is our, it is our, it is our, um, our privilege and our mandate to care for those God has given to our charge. What Jesus is saying is, this is not an argument against familial propriety, but divine priority. Who is the priority in your life? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught us what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. Then all the areas of your life will fall into place. But I come first. And from that priority, then I'm calling you to trust me with everything else. But I come first. The crowd says, Jesus, we love you. Jesus, you're great. But, 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 I would do this. I would take this step. But there's this thing, Jesus. Now, when this thing changes, when this is different, then I'll follow you. When, when, when this isn't like it is, when this person doesn't do this thing anymore, often our excuses are people. Then I'll be in the boat. But the disciple says, I get in the boat and I trust Jesus to work out the rest. Turn with me to the companion passage of this one, Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Same passage, but instead of two, this time we get a bonus guy. Matthew records two people having to make that decision. Luke records three that are making that decision. 
So let's pick up verse 59. Luke chapter 9, verse 59. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. What was to be his priority? The kingdom of God. Still another said, now here's the next guy. This is the third one. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, and this puts it all in place. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. What comes first? And it's always easy. But when the disciple says, I will love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind, they mean it. The person in the crown says, I will love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind, but, 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 but. Now listen, church. I believe every day Jesus is calling me deeper. And I believe he's doing the same thing with you if you know him as your Lord. And as I wrestle in my life with what holds me back, a lot of it's me and what I want and my comfort and my security and what moves me along to what I desire. And I need to repent of that and make Jesus my passion, my love, and a willing to wherever he leads, that's where I'm going to go. The other thing that stands in my way is a lot of excuses. Lord, in this area of my life, I would, I would, I would, I would, but, but, but. The disciple says, Lord, if you're calling, if you're leading, that's what comes first. And I'll trust you even with those I love. Even with those I love. To put you first. And follow you. Now I sense the Lord's maybe been speaking to some of you, maybe even this week, about his desire to invite you to step out of what's easy and convenient where the crowd resides to following him in a deeper and greater way. And as I close today, I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you and pray a prayer of of, of, of maybe for some of us repentance, but a prayer of release that when Jesus moves us to deeper water, we won't look to self or to excuse. We'll truly be his disciple. Let's pray. Father God, sometimes we think about you asking us to step out of the boat but today you're asking your disciples to step into the boat to go to deeper waters and Lord I, I think all of us who have a genuine faith in you sense a call a call to live out a life that's worthy of the calling we received. A life that's a true living sacrifice and, and there's not a man not a woman who's ever lived even Paul said, I've not yet taken hold of it. Not any of us feel like we're, we're fully there, fully arrived. But Lord, we do know that you're calling us to something deeper. And I think about what stands in the way of that. For that man who was that teacher of the law, himself, it was comfort, it was ease, it was security. It was what he could gain. But Lord, as you suffered loss, Lord, may we be able to suffer loss for the cause of the cross. And Lord, for the other man, he rests secure that he could get back to it later once something changed. But Lord, if there is something that holding us back, some excuse that's keeping us from doing what you've specifically asked us to do or called us to do, Lord, or in some way you're calling us deeper, 
Lord, I pray we just go before you in that in that very thing. Pray over that very reason, and Lord, get your desire over such things. So that we can follow you and, and be where you called us to be without fear, without reservation, and within in peace to, to be where you are. Lord, I know one of the things, Lord, that you've impressed upon me about this church is that, Lord, we're not trying to be fancy, but Lord, we, we do want to be earnest and sincere. And I know that there are many sincere followers and lovers of you in this place. But there's not a one of us that you're not calling us deeper. And so, Lord, whatever that may be that's holding us back, Lord, we repent right now. And today we choose to follow you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's close today with a beautiful song. Stand up, stand up for Jesus.